Our main text for today is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, and I also just want to say what's up to everybody. Um, My name is Tony, and I serve as one of the leaders within this church, and I'm uh, just so thankful uh, to get to be here with you today. I was standing over here, hearing us sing those songs, and I get to sit right up here next to the kids, and I was just reminded, um, man, what a special thing for them uh, to be here in this space with us and to hear us singing those words about about Jesus, about his kingdom. Uh, come, come, Lord Jesus, come. Uh, what's another lyric that we were singing? Uh, Even if the whole world turns away, I will stay with you, my God. Man, even if, even if that's all we did this morning, them hearing us proclaim that, that's enough. Amen. Um, amen. So before I get started, um, I actually need three volunteers that are going to help me with this message, and um, <laughs> I just saw some really funny faces out there. So don't worry, it's not, you, there's no speaking parts here, I'll just tell you what it is. You're going to come up here, three people are just going to come and sit at this table for the duration of this message. And so you probably, you don't have to do anything, you can bring your notes, you can just sit up here and listen. And specifically, what I'd love to have is some generational diversity. So I would love a baby boomer, I would love a millennial, uh, or Generation Y, and then I'd love a Gen Z. So a baby boomer, you know who you are. Uh, millennials, that's actually ages 25 to 40. Are you coming up, buddy? All right, come on up. Uh, 25 to 40, uh, and then Gen Z is uh, 25 or under. So are you, what's that? Yeah, you can just grab a seat up there, man. Uh, which of those do you fit in, boomer, millennial, or Gen? You're 24, all right, Gen Z, represent. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, Brad Taylor. Give it up for Brad Taylor. I recently turned 40. You're 41. All right, all right. Go ahead. You're, you... So, uh, yeah, all right, Phil. So, you're, you're a millennial. Yes, sir. Yeah? All right, man. So, uh, it's, not, it's not gender diverse up there. It's guys, but just go with me here, all right? So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, You feel free to light the candles if you want. The water is fresh. I just put it up there. So, all right. So I actually want to start the message this morning now uh, by giving us the the kind of the overall flow of the message. And I I want to use hand motions to do that. And so we're going to, you feel free to do this along with me if you want. So we're going to start here at the ground level. This is the ground level. We're going to start right here at the ground level in the, the, like the grittiness of everyday real life. And then, as we look at this holy text together in Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to go, like, we're going to go up the mountain. We're going to lift our eyes and climb the mountain, and we're going to hang out there for a little bit. And then the plan is to come back down to the ground floor, and then toward the very end of the message, we're going to go back up the mountain, and then at the very end of the message, by God's grace, we're going to go even higher than, uh, than we could see, or maybe even higher than we could possibly go on our own. So that's, that's the, the message right here. Got it? Mm-hmm. And then back down, and then up, and then up. I saw nobody else doing that with me. All right, so you feel free. It's like this. It's a kind of a little dance, you know? All right, there we go. All right, so let's, let's, let's start there at the beginning, at, at the ground floor. And to get us going, I want to actually invite us into uh, an exercise. It's just going to take a moment or two here. Specifically, I want to invite us to consider the question, who are the followers of Jesus with whom you are connected who are the followers of Jesus with whom you are connected? Maybe these are people who you get to see a lot in this season, or maybe these are people who you don't get to see quite as much in this season as you did in a previous season. Maybe these are people in your community group, if you're part of one of those. Maybe they're people uh, with whom you serve on a ministry team, or maybe these are just people who you like hang out with, like you, you share the table together, you share the table together in your home or in your neighborhood or something like that. Who are the followers of Jesus with whom you are are connected. Begin just for a moment here to like scroll through the names and even the faces. And let's, let's not rush past this. Like really try to take a deep breath if you haven't done that yet today, or, or maybe two or three. And let's like even ask God to bring specific people to our hearts and minds in these moments. Who are the followers of Jesus with whom you are connected? Let's take a moment.
And so, God, we say, not to us, but to your name be the glory today. And we ask that you would come and do a work here. What, whatever you want to do, God, that's, that's, we want that. And to the extent that we don't want that, God, we confess that too. So come, Holy Spirit, come and move among us in these moments, again, for your glory here and in this city and among the nations of the earth. We pray this and we do all this in the name of King Jesus. And everybody agreed and said, amen. Amen. So as we've been saying, we as a church just strongly sense that God is calling us to action. And we've been saying that we as a church are all about King Jesus. And that we as a church are all about everyone living the beautiful and radical way of Jesus. And we, are, we as a church are all about the city of Fort Wayne and the nations of the earth singing for joy in the name of Jesus. And we want to be a people who don't just say those kind of things and don't just talk about those kinds of things, but who actually do them, who actually more and more take action in everyday real life. And as we've been saying, there are four basic ways that we do that as followers of Jesus, four basic actions as we follow Jesus together. We you see them up on the screen. We bow together, we sit together, we walk together, and we run together. And the last couple of weeks, we focused on this idea of everyone bowing, and that is about worship. And today and next week, our plan is to focus on now everyone sitting, and that is about relationships. And not just any kind of relationships, but relationships that orbit around the person of Jesus, around pursuing Jesus together and living the way of his kingdom together. Notice that all of those actions that I mentioned, all four of them, are intended to be together. We bow together, sit together, walk together, and run together. And the language that we as a a church have used for a long time now about being together in relationships is the table, right? Sitting, the image is sitting together at the table, both, and we mean that both figuratively as a way to talk about relationships, but also just quite literally like sharing the table together, having transformational conversations across the table, learning to be authentic and real with one another around the table, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, serving and being served at the table. And I just want to say again, I absolutely love how simple this is. This right here is life in the kingdom of God. Everyone sitting. And everyone, I'm going to say it again, that everyone includes you. That everyone includes You and your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren and beyond. That everyone includes the person sitting next to you right now. You can elbow them if you want to. That includes the person sitting next to them. Don't don't elbow them because it's going to get crazy in here. The person sitting next to them, and if you turn and look, even the person way down the aisle. That everyone includes who? The people who are not yet here. And we as a church are all about that, everyone sitting. And in Ephesians chapter 2, again, our main text for today, the Apostle Paul wrote these words, starting in verse 19. He said, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with King Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And everybody agreed and said, amen. So from this letter itself, just a little bit of context here, from the letter itself and actually from church tradition as well, we believe that the Apostle Paul is the one who crafted this this beautiful, purposeful, spirit-inspired letter, and that he wrote this letter from a prison, it says, either in the city of Rome or in the city of Ephesus, and that he wrote it to this 
like ragtag group of women and men and children, slave and free, Jew and Gentile, who were all united together under the kingship of Jesus. And so for a moment here, just try to imagine the Apostle Paul there in that, in that prison cell working on this letter, probably with not enough food and with not enough sleep. Probably he was beaten up, potentially sick. He was alone in this dark, small room that smelled absolutely horrible, writing on whatever piece of papyrus he could get in whatever light he could get and taking every opportunity he could get to communicate with his fellow believers what he sensed the spirit of the living God wanted to say to this ragtag group called the church. And actually the prevailing thought today is that this was intended to be a what they call a circular letter. Not because it was shaped like a circle, but because it was intended to circulate. It was intended to circulate from church to church to church, from ragtag group to ragtag group to ragtag group in and around the the ancient city of Ephesus. And my brothers and sisters, what Paul wrote there in that dark, dingy, messy, hard, seemingly insignificant setting is intended to lift our eyes. And may I say our souls and our very lives to some incredible heights. And so let's go there. Let's, this is where we're going to go from down here at the ground level. If you remember the outline, now we're going to go up the mountain. And let's go there together. Let's lift our eyes to see a glimpse of what this holy text says about you and about me and about all those people that we just thought about a few moments ago. Paul wrote again, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers. And Paul here, in in these words, is specifically addressing the the Gentiles, right? The the non-Jewish people within those ragtag groups of believers. In other words, he is, I love this, he is addressing people from among the nations. Unless you're Jewish in background, this, this includes you today. He's addressing people from among the nations. That consequently you there in verse 19, th- that is the you. And just a bit earlier in the letter, Paul had written to these very same people that at one point in their lives, they were separated from King Jesus. They were, they were excluded from citizenship in the covenant people of God. And they were strangers to the covenants of the promise without hope, it says, without hope and without God in the world. But now, Paul wrote in the letter, in Jesus and through Jesus and his death on the cross, consequently, because of Jesus, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens, kingdom citizens together with God's people, and also members, like family members of his household, built... And so now Paul begins here to use like, he switches metaphors as he often does right in the middle of a sentence. And he uses architectural imagery. He says, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with King Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building, talking about the church, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple In the Lord, my brothers and my sisters, Paul describes the church as the temple. And let's be real for a minute. (laughs) Because in our cultural context, in our ears, that that might be like an interesting thing, but it doesn't have much like much meaning to it, does it? I mean, we might kind of get it if we've been around the Bible a bunch, but like we, we, in our cultural context, we have sacred spaces. We don't think about them that way, and we certainly don't call them the temple. And so it just doesn't, in our context, we have to do some work to have it have meaning for us. Because in Paul's heart and mind, what he writes here is like a shockingly big and high statement. And so for just a few moments here, let's try to lift up our eyes to see what he's saying. And as you may know, One of the most, this is strange, but it's true. One of the most central elements in the story, not just of the Hebrew scriptures, but of the entire scriptures, one of the most central elements is this building. You ever stopped and thought about this? It's it's this this building that was originally a tent called the tabernacle that moved from place to place to place along with the people. And then once they got into the promised land and into Jerusalem, it became this more permanent structure called the 
the temple. You see a picture of it coming up here on the screen, actually a picture of a model of the temple. And in the story, when God rescued his people in the book of Exodus, you read about this, when he rescued his people from slavery in Egypt, it says that he brought them to himself at Mount Sinai, and there he formed a covenant with them and gave them instructions about how to live with him as king. And as a central part of that, he instructed them to build a tent, like this movable building. In Exodus 25, God said to Moses, have the people make a sanctuary for me, talking about the the tabernacle, have them make a sanctuary for me, and I, here we go, I will dwell among them. God said, I will dwell among them. I will have my glorious presence be associated with this building. This, This building You see, this this tabernacle slash temple was designed to be the place of God's presence. It was designed to be the hot spot, if you will, the hot spot of God's presence on the earth. This building that was still standing at the time that Paul wrote this letter that we call Ephesians. And as you can see, and as you may know from your own study, that this building had all kinds of different parts to it. There's a number of things going on according to God's instructions. And at the very center of it was that most holy place. And that was designed to be like the hot spot of hot spots of God's presence. And in that inside of that most holy place, which was shaped like a cube, again, according to God's design, it was shaped like a a cube. And uh, inside of it was the Ark of the Covenant. You know that thing that Indiana Jones and a bunch of bad guys are always looking for? There's the Ark of the Covenant, and nobody could go in there except one person on one day of the year, in a very prescribed way, they could enter behind that veil, behind that curtain, and enter into that place, the most holy place in the temple. And the question is, like, why, why all this, God? <laughs> like, what, what is going on? What is the point of the tabernacle slash temple and the, the most holy place and all that? What, what is the purpose of all of it? And then there's probably, there's certainly many answers to that that we can find in the scriptures. And the way that some people have come at this is to say that the temple, part of what's going on here, is that the temple was designed to be the intersection of heaven and earth. The temple, the tabernacle tabernacle slash temple was designed to be the intersection of heaven and earth. You see, in the biblical framework, heaven is not some place really far away that we hope to go to one day when we die. But rather, heaven is a word that is used to describe God's space, where God is present and where God is king. And in the beginning of the story, as we read it in the scriptures, God's design for the universe was that heaven and earth would be like this, that heaven and earth would intersect and overlap. Heaven, God's space, where God, again, where God is present and God is king, and earth, our space, so to speak, where what we see and are familiar with intersected and overlapped as you read the story in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 there in the Garden of Eden. But in the story in Genesis chapter 3, when the first humans rebelled against God, there was a separation. Because of sin and rebellion, heaven and earth were in that sense separated. And God was no longer king over and present with us in the same way. And church, this strange building was aimed at recreating and representing this Garden of Eden reality. This building was intended to be the intersection of heaven and earth. It was designed to be a tiny outpost of God's royal presence and kingship. Which is why the instructions that God gave the people for crafting this thing, this building, it was just filled. The instructions were filled with all kinds of links and allusions back to the Garden of Eden in the beginning. Check it out. In the temple, there was a river that flowed out to the east. Just like, according to God's design, just like. Like in the Garden of Eden, there was a river that flowed out to the east. In the temple, by God's instructions, there was gold and onyx and other stones, just like in the garden. In the temple, there were images of the tree, intentional images of the tree of life, just like you find the tree of life in the garden. 
Over that Ark of the Covenant, remember there in the most holy place, uh, the, that cube structure at the very center of it, over the top of the Ark of the Covenant, there was part of the design was there was these crazy angelic creatures called cherubim, whatever they are. Just like after the rebellion, it says, Eden was guarded by those same crazy angelic creatures called cherubim. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. And again, and may I say most significantly, God was present with them in the garden. It says in Genesis chapter 3, 8, that God walked, imagine God walked there in the cool of the day. And in the Hebrew scriptures, the only other three times that it says that God walks is in this building, in the tabernacle slash temple. You see, the temple is the chosen place of God's manifest presence and glory. It is the hot spot of God's presence. It is the intersection of heaven and earth. And from that dark, dingy prison cell, Paul wrote these words about the church. He said, in Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Church, we are the temple. This ragtag group of women, men, and children, red, yellow, black, and white, rich, and poor, Hoosiers, and Buckeyes, Boomers, Millennials, and Gen Z, and more. This group of people is somehow, right here, somehow designed to be the intersection of heaven and earth in Jesus. In Jesus, we are designed to be the hot spot of God's glorious presence and kingship. And all of that is true, it says, in him. In Jesus, whom Paul called the chief cornerstone. The most significant part of the foundation of the temple. And it was a large stone. The chief cornerstone was the large stone that was put in first and that determined the shape of the rest of the structure. It says in Psalm 118, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. My brothers and sisters, if you hear nothing else today, hear this. Jesus has accomplished something that is so breathtaking and marvelous in our eyes. And consequently, we are no longer strangers from God. And we are no longer strangers from one another. And we are no longer excluded from the covenant. And we are no longer dead in our sins. We are no longer without hope and without God in the world. Instead, it says, in him the whole building is joined together and rises to become this holy hotspot of his presence and kingship right here in this city and throughout the world. And in him, you too you also are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And notice, amen, and notice the word there, together. And so we've been up here, we, went, we did this motion, right? And now we're, now we're going to come right back down. We're going to try to come right back down the mountain, down to the ground level where, where the hope is that we can live this out more and more together. Notice the word together. Verse 21 says that the stones of the building are joined together. And actually, they think that Paul just made this word up. It's not found anywhere else in the Bible or anywhere else in ancient literature. And what he did is just took the word together and he put it with joined together. So it's like, it's a word like together, joined together. You, see, you get what he's saying. He says the stones of the building are together, joined together. And then in verse 22, he says it again. He says, you are being, you two are being built together. And part of what he's doing here is playing off the imagery of those rocks of the temple being fashioned and fit together. A few weeks ago now, I had the opportunity to go on a field trip with my fourth grade son, Sages, and it was a field trip over to Souter Village. 
Has anybody ever been to Souter Village? Yeah, it's this, Souter Village is this like little farm type village from the 1800s. And actually there's another part of it from, that's like a separate part. That's like a little town from the early 1900s and it's over near Archbold, Ohio. It's actually pretty cool. And so we w- went there and there's like all this stuff going on. There's a tinsmith shop. There's a one room schoolhouse there in the village. Over in the early 1900s part, there's, a, there's an old school movie theater showing a silent movie. There's the ever popular candy shop and more. And one of the first places that Saj and his little buddies and I went into was, together was the, the Cooperage. Does anybody know what a Cooperage is? Anybody know what a Cooper is? A Cooper is someone, I didn't know this until I went to Souter Village, a Cooper is someone who makes barrels. Did, did you guys know that? This is new to me. Anyway, a Cooper is someone who makes barrels, and this guy who was in there, this Cooper, was explain, explained to us like this process of making a barrel, of getting the wood, and and, you know, refi- cutting the wood and refining and refining and refining the wood so that when they put the pieces of the wood together, when they fit and fashion the pieces of the wood together, the water that they put into the barrel wouldn't leak out. And this guy, again, this Cooper, shared that it was like this really long, very, very precise and challenging process that would take somewhere around 10 to 15 hours just to make a single small barrel. And we know That with the temple, that building in Jerusalem that Jesus hung out around, that Paul was very familiar with, the process of getting those rocks there in that right place and then rightly fitting together, it didn't take 10 to 15 hours. No, it took 40 years. It took an entire generation of people. And oh man, how how many of you know that that's the way it is? You see, the challenge there, the main challenge, we think, in the church in Ephesus was very different people, like this ragtag group of very different people, culturally different people coming together, being joined together in relationship. My brothers and sisters, in Jesus, we are the temple of the living God, and a central part of how we live this out is being fitted and fashioned and joined together in relationship with one another. That's why at that turning point of the letter in chapter 4, verse 1, that we studied a few weeks ago, Paul says, As a prisoner for the king, therefore I urge you all to live a life worthy of the calling you together have received. And then what's the very next thing he says? Be completely humble and gentle. It's relational. And then he says, be patient, bearing with one another in love. It's relational. And then he says, make every effort. If it takes 10 to 15 hours of hard work, if it takes 40 years, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And church... I just want to recognize that all that can be like still right up here. That can still be like really heady, philosophical, and theoretical. But what we want to do today is try to bring it right here to the ground floor. And I want to say that so much of that happens as we sit together at the table. So much of this idea, this grand idea of being the temple, God's holy presence being manifest among among us because of what Jesus has done, so much of it actually happens more and more in the grittiness of relationships in everyday life as we simply sit together at the table. And this brings us back to everyone doing that. Everyone sitting. And this is the way of Jesus. This is what we see Jesus doing Everyone sitting. This is what we see Jesus doing. This is what we see the early church doing when his movement started there. In, in Acts chapter 2, part of the summary statement of the life together of the earliest church says that they broke bread in their homes. This is what the church did. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. In other words, as a central part of following Jesus and being the temple, we see the church simply sitting together around the table. And again, we mean this both like literally around the table, in your home, 
at the coffee shop, down on the landing, or wherever it might be. We, it literally, and we mean it figuratively, in relationships that orbit around Jesus. Sitting together at the table is the way of Jesus. It's beautiful, and it's simple, and it's something that every one of us can do. And next week, by God's grace, we're going to pick up right here, and we're going to talk about and think about community groups and about what we do, what we actually do when we're sitting together at the table in the name and way of Jesus. But for this morning, as a lead into both communion and prayer, I want to give a couple invitations. I want to invite us, brothers and sisters, to think again about those people who came to our hearts and minds at the beginning of this message. Think, think again about those followers of Jesus, those believers with whom you are connected. And as an action step, I want to invite us, like as you think about those people, maybe they're sitting next to you, maybe they're not here this morning, maybe they're far away, whoever they are, I want to invite you to express thanksgiving to God for them. I mean, what a gift to get to be in this with other people. What a gift. Express thanksgiving to God, and I want to invite us to express thanksgiving to one another. As we come to the table in, in some moments here, before we come, while we come, or after we come, could you go to someone else right here in this room? Could you go to some other people? Could you send some text messages? Could you do whatever, do whatever you do to communicate? Could you go to somebody else and just thank them? Thank you for being a friend. Say, thank, thank you for being in this together with me, or just simply look them in the eye, eyes and say, thank you. So I want to invite us into that as we come, again, before we come, while we come, and after we come to the table. And then also, the second part of it is, I want to invite us to think about this empty chair right up here. You see, it is such a gift from God to have kingdom friendships, to be connected with other believers. But we around here, are about everyone, everyone sitting, everyone being invited to come and to sit in the empty chair. And so who could you invite to come and do that? Either, either like literally at a table or figuratively in relation. Who is God nudging you to invite and to come and sit in the empty chair at your table? And maybe today, that empty chair is for you. That's probably true. That's certainly true in this room. Maybe you've got some like pain associated with this whole idea of relationships with the church. Not maybe. There's a lot of pain associated with relationships within the church. There's a lot of friction that comes with stones being fit and fashioned together. And so maybe you've experienced that. Maybe there's been some division. Again, maybe there's been some friction. Maybe today you just feel really lonely. Maybe you're surrounded by people but you feel lonely. And so for you, my brother, my sister, the invitation, if that's you, is just to simply this morning, by, by faith, with, with courage, is to take a step toward that chair. And that might be as simple as just asking God to provide some kingdom friendships in your life. That's a step toward the chair. Or maybe when we do our prayer thing that we do every week when there's people standing around here, maybe you, you could just go and say, would you pray? Would you ask God for me? To, would, that I, I want to be connected with other believers. I want to deal with this, whatever, whatever it is. I, I want to be, I want to sit in the chair. That's another way to take a step. Or maybe it's just making your, need, making your need known. Telling someone today, man, I feel disconnected. I feel lonely or, or whatever it might be. I really, I really want to sit in that chair as a part of following Jesus. And so, brothers and sisters, that's what we're going to do. It's going to be movement around the room as we come to the table, after we come to the table. And that's all, again, right here. So we've done, we've done this, and we've done this. And now, before we, as we kind of come to the table and start to lean in this direction, I want us to go back up the mountain. Because, for, because at the very end of the scriptures, in the book of Revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus, the picture that God, get this, the picture that God gives us is that one day Jesus will return and once again, heaven and earth will completely overlap and intersect. Man, this gives me goosebumps. If you read the last two chapters of the scriptures, 
Revelation 21 and 22, many of those very same descriptions are there that you see in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 in the garden and that you see in the tabernacle slash temple throughout the story. A river, those stones, uh, the tree of life is there, there's a garden. It says there's this new Jerusalem coming down out of the sky. It's not us going up somewhere. There's this new Jerusalem coming down out of the sky. And what's it shaped like? A cube just like the most holy place. It's apocalyptic language saying, hey, heaven and earth are going to be re reunited. And most importantly, again, what we see in Revelation 21 and 22 is that God is present. It says in Revelation 21, look, God's dwelling, God's dwelling is now among the people and he will dwell with them. Which means, my brothers and sisters, we as the temple are designed to be a foretaste of that coming reality. Today, we are designed to be a preview of what is to come, even though the setting, let's be honest, can be dark, dingy, messy, hard, and seemingly insignificant. Every time we sit together at the table in the name of Jesus. Every time we go to one another's homes and pull up a chair to the table and lean in together to try to just be, to live the way of Jesus together. Every single time we share the table and engage in relation, every time we send that meaningful text, even today, or say that word in the name of Jesus, every time we take kingdom steps toward one another, we are living into our identity as the temple of the living God, the hot spot of his holy presence. And by the power of the Spirit, we become this, this foretaste and preview of what is to come. And that's pretty high, right? But now, like, I have to st try to stand on my toes to, because we're going to go even higher. And his name is Jesus. You guys, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus, is, his body is that curtain, that veil. Jesus is the sacrifice. All of those things are ultimately a shadow that point to Jesus. And today we get to come to the table and take the bread and the cup and they point to him too. The bread, his body given up for, for us. The cup, his blood shed on our behalf for the forgiveness of all of our sins. All of them. And for this new life that we get to be in together. Again, you've heard it once today. Abby read it. Hebrews chapter 10 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Let us draw near, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. And that's what we get to do together in these moments. And so come thanking God for the people you're connected with. Come thanking one another and come with a heart to fill that empty, empty chair. Brothers and sisters, when you're ready this morning, you're free to come.